tell you this this morning, uh, as we're on our way to that fair land where the soul never dies, I want you to keep that in mind for the conclusion of the lesson. Uh, David didn't know that I was going to include that, but that's an extremely important part to this lesson. But uh, this, this morning, I, I think of it this way. Those of us who have been born again, because of what God our Father has done for us, we return the love and admiration to Him, and that's why we're here this morning, to worship in spirit and in truth, because we're born again. But what, because we're born the first time, that's why we return our love and admiration and affection to our mothers. And that's why we say, Happy Mother's Day. And I'm saying that, as, again, as others have said already. But I actually think about Happy Mother's Day really being implied in John 16, 21. If you could turn there with me. I'm going to read. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow. This is the words of Jesus. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. Jesus could, he could discuss this because he would go to the cross and he would experience anguish, but it was for the joy of us being able to be born again that that anguish was turned to joy. We've been born and be able to go out of the world where the soul never dies. But when we talk about this idea of that joy, but, but also realizing that that sorrow is there, whether that sorrow is remembered or whether, you know, that, that, that is something that once you hold the child, that there is that joy that over, overtakes that pain. That there's that, what Jesus is talking about. But I think it's important when it comes to motherhood, what we're talking about there is sacrifice, you sacrifice to bring us into the world. Every single one of us are here because of a sacrifice of our mother in order for us to even come into this world. And if we were born after 1973, there's a whole nother sacrifice. And the very fact that you are here is an incredible uh, sacrifice on behalf of your mother. But I want you to think about motherhood, that if, if you were nurtured and you were brought up by your mother, that sacrifice continued. I, I, I remember, um, I guess maybe paying for my raising sometimes, you know, I, I look at this, I say, how, how did I put my mother through the things that I did? Uh, but I remember she said, I brought you into this world, I can take you out, I'll put your car on blocks. You know, those are the things that, that, uh, that we, put, we put our mothers through. And you think about that, that continued sacrifice. Seriously, there are times, though, when our mothers, they face that, maybe in a different way, what Jesus is talking about, that anguish. Whether it's just simply the concept of motherhood and, and, and maybe the, the, the outcomes of that throughout life, that anguish can continue. If you do a full search of, of, of motherhood within Scripture, it's really incredible. In fact, I, I did that just looked at Jochebed. In the first three months of her motherhood, she was hiding her child because of an edict from Pharaoh in order to have all male Hebrew children to be killed. She hid him so he wouldn't die, but she also put him in that little ark and, and, and that, that, that basket that she weaved with her own hands and, and covered it in pitch to protect him and sent him down the Nile. And we understand that it was through her decision that God was able to protect Moses and actually bring the Hebrews out of that slavery. But she had, to, she had to do something that no mother should have to do. But how many others lost their child? I, I thought about Naomi. Naomi, she had to bury both of her children in their old age, something a mother should never have to do. But Job's wife did it t ten times in one day. I, I, think about, I think about Eve. Eve, who... She watched as her, well, she knew that her oldest son, Cain, killed her youngest son, Abel. I wonder if she blamed herself because of the fall. You know, I, I think about Mary as she stood at the foot of the cross watching her son take on the worst punishment of the first century and die before her very eyes. You think about the, the, the pain that mothers go through and just look through the scriptures and you'll see that, that it's there. 
But then I think about there's a list of mothers within the Scripture that, that just tried so hard to have a child. And they were listed as barren. You know, we have Sarai, who was barren, and up until her old age was able to have Isaac. Rebecca was barren. We had Rachel. Uh, you also, we, we understand that the, uh, the mother of Samson was barren before she had Samson in her old age as well. And then the final mother that I'd like for us to focus on for our lesson to bring honor for her and honor for all of our mothers is Hannah. Hannah, who was barren. But it was because of God's intervention that she was able to have a child to begin with. But because of her longing, because of her prayer, because of her focus, Hannah helps. Hannah helps. That's the title of this lesson. I believe Hannah helps our mothers, helps our parents in, in, raise, in bringing children to this world, but also raising them to be prepared to leave it. If you will, let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. It says, There was a certain man of Ramathaim Zophim, of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zuth, and Ephrathite. He had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other Peninnah. And Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. Right? So again, she wants and longs to have children, but we, we don't understand and, or, or know all the ins and outs of the anguish she went through to even bring children into this world. But I believe Hannah helps because, because of that very thing. She helps mothers dedicate their children to God. Before she ever had a child, she dedicated her children to God. If we go back and, and look at verses 9 through 11, you remember uh, the reading that we just, we just looked at. Verse 11, she says, She's vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the infliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son. Notice she says this, If you'll just give me a son then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. And so first of all, I'd like for us to focus on that. The second part is, and no razor shall touch his head. Notice she's praying to the Lord, but if you were to read the full context, she's praying silently, but her lips are moving. And Eli the priest, and again, in the context, she's in the, she's in the temple and she's praying fervently. She did this every year and yet never had a child. And at this point, she is in anguish. She's, she's, she's obviously just in, in incredible distress. And all Eli sees is her mouth moving. And, and he's saying, he says she's drunk. He says she's out of her mind. But she responds and says, I am not out of my mind. I'm praying to the Lord so that I can have a son. But she's not telling what this vow is. We get, we're privy to the vow. She's going to give her child to the Lord. But notice how is it can we do that? How can we give our child, how, how can we give our children to the Lord? And I love this. It's a picture of giving their children to the Lord before you ever have that child. Notice she says, no razor shall touch his head. You have to understand this is from Numbers chapter 6 and, and verse 1 through 5. So it's a, it's a vow of separation. It's called the Nazarite vow. And it was a vow to, to not partake of fruit of the vine, that your child would not partake of the fruit of the vine. That's what she's saying here. And that you would not allow their hair to be cut. See, that's what Samson was born uh, in that same way, with that, that same concept of a Nazarite vow. But I want you to look at verse 5 is the main point. It says, All the days of his vow of separation, no razor shall touch his head, until the time is completed for which he separates himself to the Lord. He shall be holy. He shall let the locks of hair of his head grow long. So there's going to be a time, and that's the weaning process for when, he comes, when Samuel comes into the world, that he would be a part of that Nazarite vow, and that he would be given to the Lord. But what this is talking about is being holy. To set apart your child to be holy, to be different than the world. I want you to write this in. If you're taking notes, John, go to John 17. We don't have it up on the screen, but John 17. When Jesus is praying for his apostles, it's very, very possible this could be a prayer of a mother. This could be something that, that a mother prays as Jesus knows that he's going to be leaving this world. In John 17 and verse 14, as he's praying to his father, 
He's praying specifically here on behalf of the apostles. He says, I've given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world. But as I am not of the world, or just as I am not of the world. Verse 15, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They're not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. So this idea of sanctifying is to set someone apart. Make them holy. And that's what Hannah is praying. She's saying, make, them whole, make him holy. I, I want him to be set apart for serving you all the days of his life. I think that's a beautiful picture of what, what motherhood is, of striving to bring souls into this world to raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Uh, 2 Timothy 1 and verse 5, Paul tells Timothy that he recognized something in Timothy that could only come from a mother and a grandmother. If you will, let's look at 2 Timothy Uh, Chapter 1 and verse 5, he says, I'm reminded of your sincere faith. All right, so this is Timothy's sincere faith that he's reminded of. Where did it come from? A faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. So how did Timothy have a sincere faith? It It had to do with his grandmother and his mother. His grandmother obviously passed it down to his mother. His mother passed it down to Timothy. But it was a situation where it's a faith, not not without works that is dead, that we read about in James chapter 2. It's literally a sincere faith. They they recognized it in Timothy. He recognized it in Timothy, and it didn't come from Paul. It came from a mother and a grandmother. I I love this. In in, in fact, I'd like for us to to go to chapter 3, and let's look at verse 14. He continues this this idea two chapters later. But as for you, continue in what you've learned and firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it. So he says, I recognize your sincere faith, but I want you to continue in your sincere faith. You might have had a sincere faith at one time, but if you don't continue in it, it can be sincerely dead. He's saying continue in what you have learned. Well, Knowing from who you learned it, where did he learn it? It's referring back to grandma and mama. Verse 15, and how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings. So where did they gain their faith? From the sacred writings. These writings are sacred. There's something that we've got to be very careful that we don't interject our own opinion into to explain away the text. Continue in what you've learned and, ha- and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you've learned it, and how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. So we, we understand it's through the sacred writings that we're going to gain salvation, but we're also going to f- gain faith in Christ Jesus. If we undermine the sacred writings, then we're undermining our faith. We're undermining our salvation. We're undermining Christ. All Scripture, all Scripture is breathed out by God, and it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. How can a, how can a Timothy become a man of God, com- competent, equipped for every good work? Because a child Timothy was raised by his mother and his grandmother to understand that it's the scriptures that where you gain your faith. It is in Christ where you gain your faith, but it took mama and grandma. So mothers dedicate their children to God, but also Hannah helps show children are a blessing from God. Children are a blessing from God. Uh, if you will, turn to Psalm 127. Psalm 127, it, it, it's extremely important. David's bringing this out But especially today, where just a few days ago, we understand that Roe v. Wade is is in the process of being overturned. I mentioned earlier, if you were born after 1973, that was a sacrifice in and of itself. But just the very idea that, that, that that a child that is brought into this world is is only is only viable if it's chosen. There's that idea of, 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 of a child is, 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 
is perfectly fine to throw it away if, you, if no one is choosing it. Well, this scripture establishes that that is not the case because every child is chosen by God. In verse 3, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. Where do children come from? From the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who's, who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. We live in a society that has questioned this for too long, has not seen the reward within the womb, has not seen that as a fruit from God, but maybe a, a, a fruit that is rotten, has not seen a blessing but a curse. Hannah helps because she, so, she shows that children are a blessing from God because she longed to have one. She longed for years because she understood that children were a blessing from the Lord, we have 1 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 19 beginning. If you'll turn there with me, and let's look at 19 and 20. It says, if you'll recall, when she was praying and makes that vow, and, and Eli doesn't recognize what's going on, and, and, and she then says, no, I'm not drunk. She says, I am, I am pleading with the Lord that I might have a child. And he said, the Lord has heard you, and... That was the moment, verse 19, it says, They rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah, and Elkanah knew, his, knew, knew Hannah his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Samuel, for she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. Isn't that amazing? The name Samuel means I have asked for him from the Lord. Every time she called Samuel, to come to dinner. I've asked for him from the Lord. Samuel, clean your room. I've asked for him from the Lord. She's reminded that her child came from God. That when we realize that our children that we have for a very short period of time are a blessing from the Lord, then we're going to lend our children to the Lord. Hannah helps mothers lend their children to the Lord. And, and that's an interesting thought to me. And, and, and if you will look at verse 24, it says, And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her, along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour, and a skin of wine, and she brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh, and the child was young. Then they slaughtered the bull, and they brought the child to Eli. And she said, Oh, my Lord, as you live, my Lord, I'm the woman who is standing here in your presence praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition that I made to him. Therefore I have lent him to the Lord. So he's saying, she's saying God has fulfilled his end of the bargain. But remember at that very spot she'd made a vow that she was going to give her son to the Lord so he would serve God all the days of his life. She's saying I'm fulfilling my end of the bargain Therefore, I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord, and he worshiped the Lord there. It's, a, it's a, a powerful picture of what parenthood is, what, mother, what motherhood is. We only have our children for a short period of time. I, I think of it this way, you know, uh, Ephesians 6 and verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. But then it says, honor your father and your mother, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. You know that th those two passages, they, they apply to a lifetime because children are only children for a short period of time and you obey your parents in the Lord. But then when, what happens when children are no longer children but they're adults? Honor your father and mother. It is a perfect circle of what the family nucleus has become. And, and this is why we honor our mothers, because what all that they have done in giving us life and nurture. So what's powerful to me is that, that parents, for that short period of time, while our children are in our homes, we're striving to get them ready to be with God. 
And it has to do with this idea of lending. Lending them. Do you realize God has lent your children to you? If you think about it, the fact that they're not with you forever. They're not with us forever. And I, I hate to even say it. God has lent our children to us, to our care. But in the same way, God has lent his soul, a part of himself, to every single one of us. And if you will, let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 12. This idea of lending our children to the Lord, it, it helps put it in perspective that we're not trying to, 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 to make sure that they're, that they're, it's not all about their physical uh, body. It's not about their, 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 their flesh, their blood, their bones. It's not, it's not about the, the, the livelihood that they were trying to pre prepare our children for. That is important. But look at what Solomon, who understood from a personal perspective the dangers of not putting God first. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 1 beginning, he says, Remember now your Creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come, and the years draw near of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. So notice it's the days of your youth are short, but that evil days they will come. Those ages that, that of innocence are, are, are they're, they're few and far between, they're short. He's saying, while there's innocence, what are you to remember? Your Creator in the days of your youth. Verse 2, two says, Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened and the clouds return after the rain. He's saying, until you experience the challenges of this life, what do you need to remember more? Your Creator in the days of your youth. So, Mom, Dad... We are responsible, Grandma, Grandpa, we are responsible for making sure that our children remember their Creator before those evil days come. Because he then goes on and, and, and further talks about before this, before that. And, and look at verse 6. It says, before the silver cord is snapped, or the golden bowl is broken, or the pitcher is shattered at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern. Right? So if the wheel's broken in the cistern, you're not going to be able to get any water. You know, th this is a point where when our children are at a place where they're experiencing extreme hardship, they need to have remembered their Creator before that ever took place. Why? Because verse 7, And the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the Spirit returns to God who gave it. They need to remember their Creator before their spirit goes back to the Creator. And that's a short period of time. And we've got a responsibility to make sure that their soul will always be with the Lord and not in torment. Hannah helps mothers lend their children to the Lord because she sees the most important thing is serving God. And if, if our children can come out of our homes and, and realize that it is serving God is first and foremost, not just coming into a building and leaving it, and that that's where we're spiritual, but we're not spiritual outside, then we've missed the opportunity. I think it's very important that it is the prayer of Hannah that helps us. Hannah helps us because mothers pray. Because what happens when our children leave home and they haven't remembered their Creator? Well, maybe it's because of the faith of you. Maybe the faith of their mother. And in seeing that the, the, the faith of, of, of Lois and Eunice, it kept Timothy's faith sincere. You know, when your children see what you're doing, if they see how you're living, then it will constantly be an example of coming back to God. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, <clears throat> this is after this has got to be the hardest thing I ever heard of, of Hannah being willing to take her son who's just been weaned and literally giving him to Eli for him to be raised in the temple to serve God. And he would replace Eli as the priest of God. In chapter 2, verse 1, it says, Hannah prays, and you would think as she is leaving her son, what is she thinking about? What prayer is she focused on? And I would have thought she'd been focused on Samuel. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts in the Lord. 
My strength is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There's none holy like the Lord. There's none besides you. There's no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble bind on strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry have ceased to hunger. Why? Because she saw verse 2, there's no rock like our God. You know, why is it that people turn back to God when they've, when they've experienced challenges and hardships? Because there's no rock like God. The barren has born seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. Do you think she understood when she said that? Because of the hardship she's faced, she has relied on God, and that is her focus as she is leaving her son with the Lord. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to the grave and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and on them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness. For not by might shall a man prevail, the adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them will, he will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the power of his anointed. That's the focus of the prayer. And that's when it says, Elkanah went home to Ramah and the boy ministered to the Lord in the presence of Eli, the prophet. What I love is Hannah, has, has, her focus on God, she's literally put them, she's put Samuel in God's hands. God, you're so much greater than I could ever be. You can raise my child better than I can raise my child. That's how much she trusted in the words of God. That's how much she trusted in the creator who made her son. And she's reminded of that, and, and I think it's so important that we're reminded of that. If Hannah never went through these hardships, if Sarai, if, if Rebecca, you know, if, if Hannah never went through these hardships, what kind of a mother could she have been for her child? You think about it. When we go through hardships, can we think about it in this way that God is preparing us to be able to actually have something to say when our children are hurting? That, that, that prepares us to say, well, you know, when it comes to... to, to to, when, when we've gone through situations like this, man, these scriptures got me through. God got us through. And if our children can come to know this, then it's the idea that we're not trying to take them out of the world, but we're just trying to keep them from the evil one. They're going to experience hardships, but may they look to your faith to help them navigate it. The idea is this, that we're simply trying to prepare our children to go back to the Lord, make sure that their soul that God gave them goes back to. That's simply what motherhood is. That is like you could put simply in front of it. But that is what we're striving to do. And sometimes it's the power of a mother's prayer that makes it happen. If your children have not been following, keep praying. But keep living the best that you can to strive to follow God. They're noticing. They're noticing. This morning, one of the greatest things that we can do, and I mentioned it at the very beginning, as we're, as we're, we're, we're to Canaan's land, we're on our way. We're going to a place where the soul never dies. That's the whole focus. But those of us who have been, who've been born again, we're here to worship God, to return the love and admiration because of what He gave one of the greatest blessings you could give to your mother who birthed you is to be born again. <laughs> Think about it in that way. To live your life in accordance with God's word and to be faithful until Jesus returns or until you return to Jesus. We have an invitation that we're offering to make sure your life is right with God. Can we encourage you? Can we help you in any way? Please respond now while together we stand and while we sing.